Marvelous hello, friends and loved ones. How are you today? I mean, really, how are you today? Because today is a pretty special day. Today is September 11th, 2017, otherwise known as the 30th anniversary of the Megami Tensei video game series. And so, in celebration of today, I figured I'd go ahead and play the first game. Okay, I mean, not, not, not that one. Or, or that one. Oh, okay, okay, look, the first Shin Megami Tensei game. For those of you that don't know the Megami Tensei franchise that well, allow me to sum up the basics as quickly as I can. The series started out as a novel by Aya Nishitani known as Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei. The book would later spawn two sequels as well as two completely separate video games carrying the namesake of that first book. The first one was by Telenet and has nothing to do with the series we know, but it's still a fairly interesting title that I'd love to discuss one day. The other was the first of two games made by Atlas and published by Namco. This is the one that was released on the Famicom 30 years ago today. Eventually, Atlas decided to carry on the series without being constricted to the lore of the novels and created the spin-off series Shin Megami Tensei for the Super Famicom, which was released on October 30th, 1992. As for why I'm doing an episode on this game now instead of its 25th birthday next month, well, I've got a certain other video planned for that day. The third title, an SMT Gaiden game known as Shin Megami Tensei If, would spark the creation of even more spin-offs, such as Devil Summoner and even Persona. As a whole, the Megami Tensei franchise has continued to flourish with fantastic new games and series, keeping it alive for 30 years now. But enough of that history lesson, we're here today to talk about the original Shin Megami Tensei. This game has been released for a number of consoles after the original Super Famicom version. The Sega CD, PC Engine, PlayStation, Game Boy Advance, and WiiWare. And while a fan translation of the original Super Famicom version has been available online for about 15 years, today I'm going to be playing this game the way it was meant to be played. The only officially localized version of Shin Megami Tensei to date. On the iPhone! Yep. So before I get started, I want to point out that this is what the game looks like on iOS devices, but rather than subject you all to this for the entire video, I'm just gonna go ahead and... there. That's better. Shin Megami Tensei takes place in 1990s Tokyo. Nowadays, RPGs taking place in modern day Tokyo are a dime a dozen, but back then, in the world of Final Fantasies and Dragon Quests, this was a pretty unique thing. The game stars four nameless heroes that you can call whatever you want, but I'll be using the names from the Kaneko illustration book. There's the lawful hero, Yoshio, the chaotic hero, Waruo. Wa no, no, Waruo. Wa the heroine, Futsuko, and our silent protagonist, Futsuo. The three male heroes meet each other in a dream at the start of the game before Futsuo encounters a naked woman named Yuriko who says they're destined to be together forever. And like most dreams where naked ladies show up, Futsuo wakes up before anything else can happen. Aside from the four main heroes, players will need to recruit demons to fight alongside them. This is accomplished by negotiating with them, answering their questions correctly, and giving them what they want, whether it be money, health, magnetite, or items. This mechanic has been something of a staple through much of the franchise, but back in these days it was, uh... not as polished. That's a polite way of putting it. Demon allies can be summoned through the demon summoning program that Futsuo was fortunate enough to find attached to an email from a mysterious wheelchair man named Steven. Unlike the human characters though, demons don't gain experience or level up, so players must constantly recruit stronger demons in the wild or fuse the ones they have at the cathedral to get new allies throughout the game. It's also worth noting that unlike modern titles in the series, in the original SMT, summoning demons cost money and keeping them summoned depleted magnetite with each step. This meant knowing when and where to summon your demons was important, or you might not have the resources to use them when you need them. Shin Megami Tensei opens up simple enough. Talk to mom, pet the dog, get attacked by a crazed demon ghost at the mall, buy some coffee, talk to an old guy. Pretty average stuff. Eventually, Futsuo is arrested for a murder committed by a demon and finds himself in a mysterious research lab where he meets Yoshio, who is brought here while trying to rescue his girlfriend, who just so happens to have the same name as our heroine. The two bust out, and then like any cool kids who existed in the 90s, head to the mall where they meet Waruo, getting the crap kicked out of him by this guy named Dozawa. Desperate to become stronger, Waruo teams up with the group. 
The three boys head back to Futsuo's house where mom... Um... How can I put this delicately? A demon ate her and took her form. That... Kinda sucks. But hey, at least we've still got our dog, Pascal. Man's best friend for life, right buddy? Time to fuse you with the demon boy, who is a good super strong game breaker. You're a super strong game breaker. Good boy, Cerberus. Good boy- Oh. He jumped into that portal and disappeared. I miss my dog. So the basic plot right now is there are three factions all fighting each other for dominance in demon-infested Tokyo. On one side of things, there's this high-ranking Japanese government official named Godot, and he's all like, Harumph! Demons are strong! And then there's this American named Ambassador Thorman who is all like, I am not speak Japanese good. Am willing to nuke Japan cause demons, kay? This seems as good a time as any to point out another major mechanic common to Megaten. The alignments of lawful, chaotic, and neutral. See, Godot represents chaos, where people strive for power, the strong make the rules, that sort of thing, while Thorman represents law, which is that those who upset the strict order of things should be eliminated entirely, whereas neutral is usually just... I have no strong feelings one way or the other. The point is there's no real good or evil, you just kind of side with who you most agree with. Since I'll be representing the path of neutrality for this playthrough, I'll have to take both Godot and Thorman out. But first, I need to meet with the leader of the neutral faction, the Resistance, led by the brave and amazing Futsuko. Now that all four of our heroes are together, we'll be unstoppable- Futsuko got kidnapped. By Yuriko. Remember her? The naked lady from our dream who totally wants our bod? After rescuing Futsuko from a public execution, we meet with Godot and Thorman, and politely tell both of them that everything they believe in and their philosophies are stupid. They don't take this very well. Godot goes down pretty easily, but Thorman has a bit of a trick up his sleeve. Not only is he threatening to nuke all of Japan, but it turns out he's actually the Norse God of Thunder in disguise. Whoa, 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 hold up, hold up. You mean to tell me that Ambassador Thorman is Thor? Man. Once we take him out, the day is saved. Except Thor decides he's just gonna nuke Japan anyway. Man. Talk about being a Thor loser. After the blast, Futsuo, Yoshio, and Waro find themselves in a mysterious world called the Diamond Realm. Futsuko apparently had the power to protect us from the explosion by sending us here, but not herself. So, you know, she's dead. We do a few favors for this guy named Enno Ozuno, kill a few of his enemies, kill a few of his allies, and just have a pretty productive day. Except apparently it wasn't a day! It was like 30 years! In those decades, demons have only grown in strength and numbers. Humanity has divided itself even further into factions of law and chaos, and perhaps worst of all, a whole new method of currency was established. So any and all money you had up to this point in the game is now garbage. Have fun saving up more, cause the demons are tougher, you're down a party member, and reviving dead characters is fairly expensive. First order of business is that a woman's voice keeps screaming in our heads, and we should probably do something about that. The girl is being held captive in a messiah prison, but the only way to save her is to first rescue a psychic held captive in a guy in city run by... Oh hey, it's our buddy Ozawa! Waro, remember Ozawa? He beat the crap out of you 30 years ago? Remember? Remember Ozawa? Yeah, he remembers, and he's pissed. In a blind rage to kill Ozawa, Waro steals one of your demons to fuse with himself and becomes a... that. He becomes a that. Once we take out his demon bodyguard, murdering an old man is a piece of cake for demonic Waro. Except Waro now realizes us non-half-demon losers aren't strong or cool enough to hang out with him anymore, so he's out of here, squares. For those of you keeping track at home, we have gone from four party members to two pretty quickly. But now that we've rescued the Soul Diver, yes, that's what he's called, we can enter the soul of the woman in my head and kill this naked spider lady possessing her. Now we learn that the woman we saved is... Futsuko? But how? I thought you died in the blast! Oh, she did die, but this woman is the reincarnated version of her who looks exactly like her and remembers all of our experiences together. 
Alright, cool. The three of us now have to head through Rapungi, where we meet a sweet little girl named Alice. She just has one little itsy bitsy favor to ask of us. And yes, Megaton fans, you know what's coming. She, she she said the thing that she's known for saying! After saying no and making the girl cry, her Uncle Red attacks us. Also, he's an invincible demon named Belial, who can only be stopped by sucking him into a magic pot. Which we just so happen to find lying around in the basement! Hooray! Now nothing can stop! Alice's other uncle killed Yoshio. He's dead. That sucks. But we can at least kill Nabiros in revenge and let Yoshio's soul be free. Let's get the heck out of this place. The main goal now is essentially the same as before the blast. We need to meet with the leader of the lawful messiah order, Anyel, and the leader of the chaotic ring of Gaia, Echidna. While searching for clues, we encounter Waro, who seems to be doing pretty well for himself. He warns us not to go to Ikebukuro, so naturally we make a beeline right for there, get arrested by Waro for coming there, and are put on trial before Judge Yama. Judge Yama says a bunch of stuff that I wasn't really listening to, because throughout the whole trial I was humming Ace Attorney music to myself. But the gist is, we actually have to make a choice between law and chaos. No neutral options here. Since my general rule of neutrality has been to tell everyone to shove it, I end up killing Judge Yama and busting out. Unfortunately for me, this choice made me officially... lawful. I couldn't stay neutral forever. See? See the way my little triangle body is spinning? That means I'm lawful. But that's okay, because our next location has a way to cure me of my non-neutrality. Buckle up, folks. We're going to Disney World! Well, it's called Destiny Land in this series, but Disney World! Not only is this where we'll meet Echidna, but there's a minigame where we can change our alignment back to neutral for a small fee. And the guard dog to this magical kingdom is even our old dog Cerberus, who rejoins us! This really is the happiest place on Earth. Even Waro managed to get himself a cool cape-wearing girlfriend adventuring partner. Good for him. Echidna is this enormous snake lady, and she explains that the Messians are building a huge basilica for themselves and plan to wipe out everybody who doesn't agree with them, and asks us to at least consider helping them, as they've already got agents and demons ready to raid it. So we go meet with Anyol to hear his side of things, and... Oh hey! Yoshio got brought back to life as the Messians' own personal Jesus. Good for him. Nice to see you again, buddy. I'm gonna kill your angel friend. But... We're still cool, right? But remember folks, we're neutral. That means when we go back to tell Echidna we killed her biggest rival and she's all like, so does that mean you're gonna help us? I've gotta be all like, no, and kill her too. Did I mention there aren't really good guys in this game? I mean, you really just kill whoever doesn't agree with you. In fact, if you think about it, neutral people have to kill twice as much. With Anyul and Echidna both dead, there's one itsy bitsy teeny weeny problem. We now don't have any way to get into that super cool Basilica Club all the lawful and chaotic peeps are so keen about. What am I even say- But luckily for us, 30 years ago, we talked to an old man at the park once. And that old man built a super secret underground tunnel just for us cool neutral peeps to use to get into the Basilica. Which honestly, I think he, Futsuko, and I are pretty much it. Wara and Yoshio are literally having a shouting contest across a hallway when we show up. Wara's all like, DUDE, IT'S NOT TOO LATE TO HELP CHAOS, HELP ME RECRUIT THE POWER OF THE FOUR HEAVENLY KINGS, AND YOSHIO IS ALL LIKE, NO WAY DUDE, YOU'VE GOTTA HELP LAW DESTROY THE FOUR HEAVENLY KINGS. SO I GO KILL ALL FOUR HEAVENLY KINGS, AND THERE ARE SOME OF THE EASIEST FIGHTS IN THIS ENTIRE GAME. LOOK, HERE IS UNEDITED ONE OF THESE FIGHTS, I DIDN'T ALTER THIS AT ALL, OR SPEED IT UP, OR ANYTHING. Oh, and Yoshio, that wasn't for you. It's because I wanted to. But now you're probably asking, what did killing these four deities do? Why, flood the world and kill pretty much everybody who wasn't in the Basilica, of course! It's been a long day, everybody. So before we explore the Basilica, we need to find a way to get around flooded Tokyo. 
This can probably be accomplished by- TURTLE! There's a turtle! I wanna ride it! Okay, so, I have a quick side quest I wanna do. Since I have a heart full of neutral, I'm able to enter the Mystic Palace of Masakado, who not only presents me with Masakado, one of the best swords in the game, but I can now travel back to the locations of the Four Heavenly Kings to collect the best neutral armor in the game. The helmet, Masakado, the chest plate, Masakado, the gauntlets, Masakado, and the boots, Masakado. Masakado, do we have to hire like an ad specialist or something to like come in and, you know, help you jazz up the brand just a little bit? With that out of the way, we go back to our friends Waro and Yoshio, who apparently didn't see the entire world getting flooded as an excuse to stop yelling at each other. They tell us about two high-ranking demons on both their sides, Vishnu and Ravana, who... <sighs> Look, you guys know the drill by now. I'm neutral, I go kill them both. I honestly don't even know what their deals were. They weren't even in the Basilica, they were just hanging out in some office building. But apparently, these are the straws that break the camel's back. This is what has Waro and Yoshio being like, How could you? And storm off. Well, some friends you guys are. Waro. You're the one who abandoned me after saying I was too much of a sissy to hang out with your cool new demon form, and Yoshio... Well... Okay, you actually died protecting me, but... Come on, you got to become Jesus, so... I can only feel so bad about that. All that remains now is to take out the final bosses, who await me at the very top and the very depths of the Basilica. I decide to head down in the basement first. These floors are all pretty big, they're loaded with traps, and on the way down you have to fight three high-ranking Chaos Demons. Surge, who is really weak, Astaroth, who is really weak, and Ariok, who has a vagina in his belly. And is also really weak. Once we're near the bottom of the depths, we encounter Lewis Cipher. A perfectly friendly man in a very nice suit, who tells us that if we're planning on defeating Azura, we're going to need a special item found on an island out to the west. Well, thanks, new best buddy. I sure am glad you told me, now that we're near the bottom. So we backtrack all the way out to that island, and... Hey, there's no special item out here. Just Beelzebub telling us that he's gonna kill us. And as I'm standing over the battered, bloody, beaten body of Beelzebub, all I can think is... Lewis lied to us. More like Lewis Lifer, because he's a liar who lied. So all the way back through the depths, and this time we come face to face with Waro and his girl partner. Uh... Oh gosh, this is so embarrassing. I do not remember her name. So anyway, we kill Waro, and he's all like, "This sucks." And then, Ri, that was her name, Ri. Yeah, Ri is all like, wow, you killed the crap out of your friend. And then she reveals her true form, Lilith. Also, she was Yuriko, that naked lady we met in our dream who kept telling us how much she wanted to be with us. So, we kill her. We tend to do that to people. And as she dies, she says all she wanted was to be with us. And that's why in jealousy, she tried to kill the one closest to us. And so, to honor the death of the one who cared so much about me, we loot her body and fuse the item we stole from her with a sword to make Futsuko's best weapon. It's what she would have wanted. Okay, side note, the game never actually outright says it, but the implication we're supposed to take here is that Futsuo and Futsuko are the reincarnated forms of Adam and Eve, which is why there's a whole love triangle thing with Lilith and... Look, reincarnation is just a thing in this series. It's literally in the title, so just just roll with it, okay? With no one on the Chaos side left to stop us, we reach the depths of the Basilica and come up against Lucifer's right-hand man, Azura. I gotta say, for being a big powerful demon lord, he's kind of petty. I mean, he just mocks us for killing Waro, which, <laughs> joke's on him. I feel worse about killing Lilith, if anything. I don't have much to say about this boss fight. He hits a lot harder than most of the enemies and has a ton of HP, but after a while he goes down. Azura would have been the final boss if we'd chosen the lawful path, but since we're neutral, our work isn't done yet. Now that we've crushed the chaos side of things, it's time to head all the way upstairs to the tip top of the basilica and take down those pompous lawful folk. Much like on the way down, we have to fight three powerful general angels, Uriel, Gabriel, and Raphael. Also, like the demons from earlier, they are all very weak. 
Before we reach the tippy top, though, we've got to deal with Yoshio, who asks us... What makes a man turn neutral? Lust for gold? Power? Or were you just born with a heart full of neutrality? And then we, um... Uh... Sorry, I'm having a really hard time writing this part of the episode without using the words kill Jesus. As Yoshio passes away, he realizes God always intended for him to be a sacrificial messiah. And I realize that I think Yoshio is the only person in this game that has to die twice, so... Come on, that has to suck. But this is it, folks. The final boss. The Archangel Michael. Like Azura, he's quite a bit tougher and has a lot of HP, but I was already pretty strong when I fought Azura, and I only got even more powerful demons before I came up here. So... Dead. Michael laments that God is going to be super disappointed in him before disappearing. Futsuo and Futsuko are warped to the summit of the Basilica, where our old man guide reveals himself as... I am going to butcher this... Taisheng Laojun, the famed Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. He was our neutral guide all along, and congratulates us for restoring order to the world. The flooded, destroyed, demon-infested world. Screw it, I'm taking it as a win! And with that... Shin Megami Tensei 1 comes to an end. Wow, what a trip. What a trip. So, now that we've gone over the game, I guess it's time I just give my quick thoughts on it, huh? While it certainly feels dated in some of its mechanics, even by SNES-era RPG standards, this is a series that really tried to do things differently. It may seem a little archaic now, but I'm sure this was a pretty big deal in 1992. The game is challenging without being overbearing. The characters and story feel a little bare bones, but it's not a huge problem. It's hard to find anything in this game that wasn't done better by later installments, but that's pretty normal with a series like this, and it's still well worth checking out. Overall though, I'm really glad I revisited this game, and I'm thrilled I was able to share it with all of you. If you ever want to play it for yourself, I know some people are turned off by iOS, but I do recommend the mobile version, which is based on the GBA remake rather than the original Super Famicom version. And so, now that Shin Megami Tensei 1 is Shin Megami Tensei done, I'd just like to take this moment to say... Atlas, please localize the second one! Also, if. Thank you.